Hello guys, today's Zipdiz video game history video is about the earliest computer role-playing games. Now, the first one, or one of the first ones that we're aware of, is only known of by the name of its program, M199H. Uh, we know that it was created sometime in 1974, maybe 1975. We're pretty sure that it was created at the University of Illinois. It was probably similar to other dungeon crawl style computer role playing games that followed, but we don't really know for sure and we probably never will. As we covered in our video on early mainframe games, these early programs were mostly coded up by bored students on the fly and hidden in lesson folders. System administrators would routinely delete these games when they were discovered as it wasn't really felt like they added to the educational process. I mean, now we know that coding is coding and, and these side projects have value of their own, but back then it was just seen as, as needless cruft that took up system resources. Uh, sometimes these games would be copied and spread elsewhere before this happened, but this was not the case with M199H. In fact, it probably isn't even the first such program, only the earliest that we have absolutely any information on. And there's even some controversy about that. Should we even mention it? Uh, well, I am, clearly. M199H and the other games like it were hosted on the Play-Doh system. And Play-Doh here stands for Programmed Logic for Automated Teaching Operations which is kind of a tortured acronym for an early network linking together hundreds of schools, universities, and colleges with thousands of dumb terminals, a few mainframes, and a central hub located at the University of Illinois. It was basically the first non-military online community run in any way by the user base itself. It made use of this easy uh, tutor programming languages that let anyone design new lessons as programs. Uh, and the terminals offered not only graphics, but at the higher end, audio and music, which was a huge improvement over the earlier text-based interfaces that spawned Amurabi and the Oregon Trail. So, you know, students began to fool around and make games early on. This coincided with a new type of game out in the analog world, known as Dungeons & Dragons. Introduced in 1974, Dungeons and Dragons was unique and popular right out of the gate, spreading widely through university populations even in its first few years. Uh, it was only logical that many of these early Plato games be attempts to recreate a game that lent itself well to mathematical sorts of simulation. While we know almost nothing about M199H, we do have working copies of 1975's Pettit 5. While the file name is clearly another attempt to hide it from the system administration, something to do with a language class that was going on, it does have an official title, The Dungeon. And this is the earliest computer role-playing game that still exists in some form today. The game has a surprisingly complex backstory, possibly taken from the developer's home Dungeons & Dragons campaign. The player is an adventurer exploring the ruined castle of Ramathing in the country of Kaer Am near the town of Mursad. Uh, you've got randomly generated stats and basically the abilities of a multi-class fighter magic user cleric. Uh, you explore a 30 by 30 dungeon stocked with 26 different types of creatures trying to earn 20,000 experience points so that you can retire with honor. If you manage it, if you pull it off, which is not easy to do, uh, you get to enter your name on a Hall of Fame list of everybody on the network who has accomplished the same feat. So every playthrough of the dungeon sees a randomly seated layout of monsters and treasures with a chance of random encounter every step you take. And when I say random, I mean random. There's no balance or increasing danger as time goes by or as you get further from the entrance. Your first encounter is as likely to be with a kobold as it is with a dragon. Uh, combat is abstracted and largely handled behind the scenes, something that computers are good with, but there's just not a lot of feedback for the player. Uh, if you choose to fight, you'll just be told what the outcome is. Spellcasting, on the other hand, is surprisingly robust and fairly faithful to the source material. The spells are, are the spells that you would see in Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, the game itself features permadeath, and since this is basically the first computer role-playing game, 
This makes permadeath the default for the genre, anything else being some kind of innovation. Uh, leaving the dungeon saves the game and logs you out of the system, refreshing your health and all spent spell slots. This is also how you trade in experience points and the only way you can level up. I mean, you also get some experience points from monsters, but true to early Dungeons & Dragons, that's relatively little compared to the amount you get for recovering treasures. As I said, it was eventually discovered, but someone managed to save a copy before it disappeared. The dungeon was very, very popular, and its developer, Rusty Rutherford III, believe it or not, had planned to implement a sequel. He never managed to do it, but another group took up the banner to create Orthanc. But before we get to Orthanc, we're going to discuss D&D. That's the lesson name. The game's actual title is The Game of Dungeons. It was created shortly after the dungeon by Ray Wood and Gary Weisenhunt, with further development by brothers Dirk and Flint Pellet. Uh, it's a, another top-down dungeon crawler that cites the dungeon as inspiration. Both games feature your adventurer traversing a randomly seated dungeon, engaging in pass-fail combat, casting spells from slots, and collecting treasure to convert into experience while risking permadeath the whole time. The game of dungeons is larger and more complex, featuring 20 9x9 levels instead of the earlier game's single 30x31. Uh, there are fewer monsters, barely more than a half dozen, but while monsters were capped at level 6 in the dungeon and players at level 4, in the game of dungeons, they scale upward infinitely. There is less random chance involved in the game of dungeons. Uh, monsters on any given floor will be at most twice the level of the floor itself, with a little bit of adjustment for how much gold you're currently carrying. If you carry a lot, there is theoretically no ceiling on how powerful you, the foe you might face, so the game does implement a system to stash or store gold so you can try and come back and pick it up later, thereby mitigating the amount of risk you face at any one time. The goal here is likewise more complex. Up above floor 17 somewhere is a dragon that you need to kill and recover its orb. This makes the game of dungeons the first game to feature a boss, predating uh, the arcade game Phoenix by quite some time. The game also features magical items like potions, attribute include increasing books, and various kinds of equipment. Development of this game continued on into 1978, adding new features, monsters, and even multiple dungeons to explore. Uh, the third game we're going to talk about in this video is Orthanc. Orthanc is obviously considered to be a continued development of the dungeon named after a tower featured in Lord of the Rings. And, similar to the dungeon, the player takes on the role of a knight entering a dungeon to earn honor. Character creation is brief, but as in the game of dungeons, it allows you to re-roll your stats if you don't like them. We've switched from a spell slot to a spell point system, and players have access to all the spells in the game from the start instead of earning them when you level up. This time, we're exploring a 22 by 24 sized 10 level dungeon, the largest one yet and one that's randomly reconfigured every 180 real-time days. Uh, the screen's UI is also more complex this time around, with various informational frames and even a mini-map that reveals as you explore. Unlike in the dungeon, the goal here isn't to reach a set experience point threshold, but to get yourself on the Hall of Fame list, meaning that over time, the game naturally becomes more difficult. While Orthanc doesn't include true multiplayer, Users on the network at the same time can encounter each other on the same dungeon levels to talk or fight. Moria is the last game that we are going to discuss today, and it began development around the same time, 1975, but features a lot of innovations that weren't seen in the other games. First of all, and most obviously, it's played in a first-person perspective wireframe maze. It also doesn't draw inspiration directly from Dungeons & Dragons, or despite the name from Lord of the Rings. Instead, it grows from conversations with the developers of the Game of Dungeons. Uh, the stats here aren't the D&D stats, but instead cunning, piety, valor, and wizardry, all in a percentile scale instead of the 3 to 18 bell curve. And another computer game first, they increase with use instead of levels and experience as a factor of character advancement. It's also the first game to require the consumption of food and water as you go by. 
Each unit is one month's worth of food, and you consume one unit roughly eight minutes. You also age at the same rate, starting at 13 and dying of old age at 100, which would require over 100 hours of play. Uh, so I did not actually test that out myself. Uh, it's the first game to have secret doors discovered by attempting to walk through walls, and it actually implemented multiplayer co-op play. Likewise, the dungeon is a single persistent universe you inhabit with the other players. There are several just simply enormous maps. There are town areas, the wilderness area, and four dungeons, each with 60 levels. That's 6-0. The monsters get tougher and the rewards bigger as you descend, with your ultimate goal being to find the Reaper's Ring. Uh, it began when the system was first uploaded uh, on level one in a random dungeon and moved to a random place on a deeper level every time it's found. So after 50 years of play, it's almost certainly somewhere on level 60. So development of these games and those that followed continues up to the present day with communities focused on internet servers emulating the Play-Doh experience like Cyber One. These games were foundational for the computer role-playing games that followed so if you're interested in this level of gaming history, give them a try. I'll, I'll put some links in the show notes and you can go check that out. 